Welcome to Dialogue, leading with the news that China's economy grew by 2.3% last year, the only major world economy to do so in 2020. And the National Bureau of Statistics released the report on national economic performance. So how has China managed to do what other major economies could not? Has the economy recovered fully from the pandemic? How is dual circulation working out? And what are the plans for 2021? To find out more, I'm joined by Andy Marks, Senior Research Fellow at the Center for China and Globalization, and Hong Hao, Chief Strategist at the Banks of Communications. And later, we were joined by Anthony Chan, former J.P. Morgan Chase Chief Economist. That is our topic. I'm Zhou Yuan. So let me start with you, Andy. Uh, the total GDP topped 100 trillion yuan in 2020. That's uh, a landmark achievement for China, expanded 2.3 year on year. But what is your assessment of China's economy in 2020? Well, thank you for having me, Zhou Yue. I think that 2020 was an enormously challenging year for every economy around the world. And we see that China is the only uh, major economy to notch positive growth. And the two words that I would use to describe China's economic performance in 2020 would be momentum and legitimacy. So while 2.3% is a great number, but fourth quarter 2020 was actually 6.8%. Mm. And for 2021, the IMF estimates 7.9%. So we can see that, um, and I'm sure we'll dive into this more later in the program, but China certainly is doing something right. It's not just positive economic growth, but we can see economic growth accelerating. In terms of legitimacy, I think what this shows too is that China is indeed experiencing a V-shaped recovery. So bouncing back from the contraction in uh, first quarter 2020. And this is vastly different from an economy like the U.S. that has been experiencing a K-shaped economy, where some people have done very well, but even more people have suffered tremendously. And I think this raises uh, important questions about the legitimacy of governance and economic management. And China clearly, I think, has demonstrated both momentum and legitimacy. And Hong Hao, obviously uh, a lot of this uh, attributed to China's uh, successful efforts to contain the epidemic, but is it the only reason? Um, I would say it is um, probably the most important part of the reason. You know, uh, you know, after all, if you don't contain the virus, people can't go to work. So if you look at the uh, growth number in the first quarter, when the Chinese economy was the worst hit by the virus, um, you know, it was minus 6.8 percent. I think it's the lowest on record since 1992. Um, but then since then, you know, because of the aggressive and effective way to contain the virus, uh, the economy bounced back. And I think going into the second half, um, you know, the economy is basically running off full cylinders. Uh, and also because the overseas market is still not producing. Mm. Uh, so the Chinese factory is actually supplying to the world's demand. And according to Ning Jizhe, uh, he is the head of the National Bureau of Statistics, he said the changing epidemic dynamics and the external environment pose a multitude of uncertainties. So the changing international economic landscape and the uncertainties in epidemic control, uh, which is more challenging for China's economic recovery, Hong Hao? Yeah, well, as you can see, you know, the more infection, the more confirmed cases there are, uh, you know, then the, the more money that a country has to spend physically and also monetarily. And therefore, you know, as you can see, the U.S. physical budget is probably the, the worst uh, since World War II. Mm. Uh, so I think, you know, for China, because we were able to contain the virus very effectively, uh, that actually, you know, if you look at the uh, central bank's balance sheet, if you look at our physical deficit, you know, most they are very con well contained. You know, we, we didn't blow our budget, and I think our uh, monetary policy didn't have to be so aggressive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to to uh, to flood the system. Uh, so I would say that you know China is doing very very well in terms of you know, containing the virus, and as a result, doing very well in terms of uh, economic growth. Yeah, uh, Andy, uh, how do you look at the different uh, responses? 
Uh, as Hong Hao mentioned, uh, many Western countries has been lower the interest and in sending money to households and businesses, where China basically maintained its interest rate and uh, recovered its manufacturing. Sure. Well, I think, uh, Zhou Yue, that this is not an accident or an anomaly. So the fact that China was able through measured, limited monetary stimulus uh, to address uh, the economic challenges of COVID-19 actually is just a continuation and an outgrowth of sound governance. So sound policy decisions effectively implemented. So if we look back over the 40 years or so of economic reform, this is really just the latest in a string of almost unbroken policy successes. So I think that, again, it's, uh, I think as we were all a little surprised by the numbers coming in higher than expected, but in a sense, this is no surprise because it's just a continuation of the strong governance that the Chinese system has demonstrated. And Hong Hao, let's also look at uh, what actually uh, contributed to the growth. Uh, national fixed asset investment increased by 2.9% over 2019. Private investment, uh, roughly 1%. So, so do you think this kind of a economic recovery is more spurred by public investment or private investment? And what is the likely uh, scenario? Yeah, I think it's driven by uh, public investment, you know, because the public has, you know, the public sector has the bigger balance sheet and more capability, more able to take on debt, you know, at, at a time of crisis. I think, you know, in, in the first half, especially in the first quarter, you know, it was quite bad, you know, to be honest. So I think the public sector has to sort of take up the load uh, and spend the money. Uh, so I think as a result, as you can see, you know, uh, um, infrastructure spending and all that is growing at close to 3%. And, and by the way, you only have less than three quarters to spend the money, all right? So it is very, very strong. I think for private sectors, you know, once the um, uh, economic uh, growth is bouncing back, uh, people have more confidence uh, in the outlook of the economy, then people will start to spend. So I'm not too worried. Have about, you, you seen know, that? Private the private investment sentiment is going up? Uh, well, if you look at the uh, what's going on in, uh, uh, for example, uh, R and D spending, if you if you look at the, you know the financing, uh, capital market financing, uh, and the amount of money that is being raised uh, in the market, and also very strong market performance, especially coming from from the upstream sectors, uh, I think all those all those numbers and all those activities are telling you that you know private sectors are actually picking up um, um, a steam right now, and confidence is coming back. Uh, talking about uh, consumption, uh, let's talk about consumption, one of the other uh, drivers of economy. Uh, China's total retail sales fell by 3.9 percent. As COVID improves, uh, the Chinese incomes will probably increase. Uh, so do you think consumption will pick up the slacks? Oh, how? Uh, yeah, more likely than not. Um, you know, as you can see, a uh, consumption sector is a downstream sector, so it tend to be the last to recover. Right? So the momentum will, will be passed on from the upstream sectors down to uh, the consumption sector. And already, you know, if you look at the discretionary spending and also uh, the uh, uh, luxury sector, they are doing exceedingly well. You know, we keep seeing reports seeing, you know, very large and long queues being developed outside many of the luxury brands' uh, uh, exclusive stores. Uh, and also, you know, car sales, for example, going into the second half of the year, car sales is picking up big time as well. So, you know, at a time when, you know, the COVID, the, the virus is still lingering around, uh, we're seeing a substantial surge in discretionary spending. And also the housing sector is doing very well, especially in the first tier city. Mm. Andy, do you share the uh, similar sentiment about Chinese consumers uh, wish to spend more? Well, I think the consumption story is a little bit complicated, Zhou Yue. So certainly uh, COVID-19 has had a negative impact, uh, not just on the overall economy, but on consumption. But uh, offsetting that also is this transition to a more digital economy, which is a double-edged sword. So it has been bad for some traditional retailers. It's been a boon for many, many uh, online retail businesses. And in yeah. fact, we've seen these boom times. 
Uh, the other thing that has also been a double-edged sword that has been a net positive for consumption in China uh, is, as uh, Hao Yue talked about, um, that because many Chinese people could not travel abroad, a lot of luxury spending has been redirected instead of going to Paris or New York or London, uh, has been spent domestically. Mm. We also see domestic travel as well. So one of the most powerful economic forces in recent years is the Chinese outbound tourist. And we look at 2020, uh, that actually domestic travel, whether we're looking at airfare, hotels, et cetera, really has actually grown quite strongly in China. Yeah. So I think that's a uh, cause for optimism for the outlook for consumption in China. But, but the problem is, Andy, will that be just a blip or, or a trend? I mean, going from all offline to online. Will offline businesses uh, go downward forever? I think this trend is irreversible, um, and that's not a very uh, surprising or especially illuminating thing to say. Um, but I think the trend towards uh, online digital uh, commerce uh, certainly is going to continue to grow. That doesn't mean the death of traditional retail, though. I think what it means is that traditional retailers, whether these are mall owners, mm. uh, traditional uh, retailers, all will and actually are adapting. So we'll see new ways of doing businesses, new packages of offerings. And of course, some of these businesses will go away, but others will take their place. And, and that also has a lot to do with the central planner's decision to rely on what we call dual circulation policy, Hong Hao. Uh, China's strategy is, seems to be readjusting production to meet domestic demand and boost consumption relying on domestic uh, demand. So will that work out and how much resilience should be considered uh, in this? Mm, I would say that the domestic market is now big enough. You know, if you if you look at the size of the domestic market, it's one one of the largest in the world. Uh, you know, in the in the single stage shopping event, you know, the shopping festival, uh, you know, people buy. You know, the sales of the sales volume of such one single day event, you know, is equal to all the public holiday shopping uh, combined in the U.S. So it's very, very significant. And I think, you know, the business case for foreign uh, companies uh, investing in China used to be that, you know, if one Chinese person buy uh, one cup of Starbucks, for example, then, you know, it will be more than enough to go buy. Mm. Yeah, so I think now, yeah, the, the, the table has turned. I think the, 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 the Chinese companies are big enough and the Chinese market has developed, has matured, uh, and people are more, uh, confident in uh, Chinese, many of the Chinese yeah. products. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see the domestic market continue to grow, uh, you know, because it's sizable, it has reached a critical mass. Mm. I know that you've written a book uh, named Forecasting. If I wanted to forecast the economy for China in 2021, what would be the biggest driver for growth and what might be the biggest risks? Uh, yeah, thanks for the compliment. Uh, I would say that um, exports would be uh, a huge driver, continue to be a huge driver. It has been since the second half of the year. I think, you know, even though the overseas uh, economy is, is trying to bounce back, you know, by containing the virus, by rolling out uh, the vaccine, uh, it will take time. All right. So I think, especially for the first half, I think oh. the Chinese factories will continue to supply global demand. So I think exports will continue to grow. Uh, and I think consumption, just now we mentioned that consumption would be the last sector uh, to recover, you know, in a, in a sequence of recovery. Uh, so I would say that, you know, going to probably into the second half, uh, consumption, uh, the driver, uh, growth driver from consumption would be much more obvious than it is now. Uh, and I think uh, investment will continue to grow as well, you know, because uh, we have the 14th uh, uh, five-year plan, uh -huh. uh, which emphasizes on uh, investing on technology and, and many other high-tech sectors. All right, uh, Andy, of course, COVID is a game changer for the global economy, but can it be a constant disruptor, uh, especially for China? Because recently we've seen wave of new cases across northern China, 
uh, with hundreds of local infections in recent days and millions of people are in lockdown temporarily. So do you think the new outbreak might derail Chinese economic recovery in 2021? Well, I certainly hope not. Um, and there are still significant risks. So I think China has demonstrated the competence of its government in terms of policy making and policy implementation, and it's shown itself to be world class. But the challenges China and the rest of the world are confronting are also, I think, unprecedented. So, so far, it looks like this outbreak that the ability of the Chinese system to learn, to adapt, to contain these latest outbreaks in a very targeted way without systemic disruptions, I think is a very positive sign. But we also need to recognize that uh, COVID-19, in a sense, is kind of this quote-unquote gray rhino in uh -huh. that many experts have been talking about a pandemic, a global pandemic for many years, yeah. climate change. There's other threats uh, that I think we shouldn't be too surprised if they eventuate in the next few years. But again, I think the solution has to be effective governance. And Andy, I also want to talk about uh, employment a little bit. Uh, tens of millions of people are still out of jobs in U.S. and Europe, but in 2020, 11 million increase in number of jobs in urban areas here in China, notably higher than the target of 9 million. Uh, that is a 131% increase uh, on expectations. But the question is, how can a 2.3% growth guarantee 10 million jobs in 2020? Sure. No, that's a great question, Zoe. So I think this goes back to my second keyword for China's economic performance in 2020, which is legitimacy. So with uh, positive economic growth, but also uh, concern and effective measures to ensure that the more vulnerable uh, people in society are not left behind or any damage to them is mitigated is incredibly important for the legitimacy of a government. And we see, as you mentioned, in places like the U.S., uh, a small number of people have benefited uh, incredibly well uh, through the stock market, through white collar jobs, but a very large number are struggling and uh, it looks like the outlook is darkening for them. So why was China able to do this, as you say, with a 2.3 percent uh, yeah. growth? I think it's just a question of priorities uh, because China recognizes the foundation of a humane and legitimate system of governance really doesn't depend on how far a few people can advance, but how does society as a whole do? And jobs are the foundation. Without widespread employment, uh, hope for a better future, it's hard to see how any society can prosper. Okay, and we have Anthony uh, joining us on the line. Uh, uh, Anthony, uh, we've been talking about the Chinese economic growth, but people say uh, nobody's safe until everybody is safe. It, can we also say uh, nobody is going well until everybody is going well? Because according to the World Bank, the U.S. economy contracted by 3.6 percent, European uh, Eurozone by 7.4 percent. That contributed to global pullback of 4.3 percent. Well, China's economy uh, is doing relatively well, but can it spill over to the rest of the world? Anthony? Well, there's no question that there are going to be spillover effects uh, from all this uh, uh, economic activity. And that even though China did very well on the back of very strong exports, uh, as you go into 2021, you really need the rest of the world to start picking up. The good news, however, is that uh, with all the stimulus, the fiscal stimulus that we're seeing right now, we're probably going to see very robust growth uh, in the United States, and that robust growth is going to spill over into Europe and certainly into China. In fact, I believe that China might be able to uh, Are you talking start about 2021? policy normalization. Excuse me? Are you talking about 2021? Yes, 2021. China will be able to begin policy normalization in 2021 because of all the fiscal stimulus that the U.S. imposed in 2020 and will be imposing in 2021. Uh, and, and China is, uh, is the major source of growth last year, we understand, but also it put the question of global supply chain stability into question. Uh, 
do you see uh, any major readjustment of the global value chain, Anthony? Well, I think, I think you might see a little bit of an adjustment, but it's not a major adjustment. I recently saw a very interesting uh, survey of companies in, the United, in, in China from the United States, and many of those companies said that they expect to have the same level of footprint over the next 12 to 24 months and many of them are saying they're actually going to increase their mm. footprint. So you may see some diversification to other Asian economies and maybe some of that also coming back to the United States, but not a significant amount. And now with the new administration, uh, I think it's going to be a more of a cooperative relationship between both countries. So I do not expect a major uh, retracement of those supply chain relationships. Uh, what do you think, uh, Andy? Because in... 2019, 2020, early 2020, people talking about decoupling, fending for themselves. But uh, 2020, the signing of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, and also uh, China signed agreement with Europeans on investment, and possibly uh, will join the CPTPP uh, in the future. Do you see that the world is disintegrated or more integrated? Well, I agree with Anthony that we have some cause for optimism uh, with the U.S. providing a uh, positive source of global growth and contributing to a better outlook. But what might be even more important is, as so you, as you mentioned, uh, RCEP and uh, the China-European investment deal. Because what we're seeing, too, in parallel, these are not mutually exclusive, but supply chains are still global, but the thinking is moving from just in time to just in case. Mm -hmm. And what this means is that greater regionalization of supply chains, and we look at Asia as the fastest growing, and in many ways, the most important economic region in the world, certainly the most dynamic, that a lot of the action is going to be here. And what is going to contribute to global growth in the next couple of years is dual circulation. Because when we look at this flywheel of more tightly integrating manufacturing, distribution, and consumption in China, what this means is that we can expect strong, healthy uh, economic growth in China, which will turn the external wheel, which will provide import opportunities, or if you're a foreign country, export opportunities to China, it will create uh, more competitive companies, industries around the world. Wow. And I think the last thing is when we look at the loose monetary policy, capital is looking for positive returns, and China is the only major economy offering both positive yields as well as solid economic fundamentals. Yeah. Uh, Anthony, another b big question hanging is uh, how integrated will the number one and number two economies in the world? Uh, U.S. President-elect Joe Biden has said he will not cancel the phase one trade agreement uh, during Trump administration, nor will he take steps to remove tariffs on Chinese exports. But what he will do differently in terms of his trade policy and economic policies towards China? Well, I think that what you're going to see with the new uh, Biden administration uh, is going to be a sort of a take two steps backwards and take a deep breath before you proceed, because there's no question that the number one priority for the Biden administration will be uh, to eradicate the pandemic. Very way, uh, very similar to the way that China was successful in doing it. I think now in 2021, that will be the major focus uh, for the United States. and. Uh, that means that uh, the trading relationship between the U.S. and China will take a back seat. I don't think that there'll be a lot of action on that uh, in 2021 until we are able to eradicate the pandemic as successfully as China has. And with regard to uh, all the stimulus out there, that's really setting the stage for, for good global growth in, in 2021, as Andy has mentioned. If, when you look at the Federal Reserve, for example, they increased their their balance sheet by $3.1 trillion since uh, the World Health Organization declared uh, that COVID-19 was a global pandemic. And of course, you saw similar increases uh, by the European Central Bank and to some extent, not as large, but a pretty sizable increase by the Bank of Japan. So all that is taking place. And I also 
uh, I think that it was a very positive step for China to join in in that mm. RECP because it does diversify some of that supply chain uh, uncertainty between the U.S. and China. It doesn't eradicate it because many of these other countries in the RECP also have some tariff and non-tariff barriers, but it does go a long way towards ameliorating uh, mm. that supply chain risk. But according to the China-U.S. Business uh, uh, Council, they had an, an estimate that the trade war, the trade tariffs actually, cost Americans more than 230,000 jobs. Can Biden administration uh, walk and chewing gum at the same time by doing something about the uh, tariffs with China? Well, I think they will do something, uh, but that's more uh, something that I would expect in the second half of the year. Right now, they really are going to be front and center focusing on the pandemic and not focusing on, on international uh, trade issues as much. Not to say they're going to ignore it, but it's certainly not going to be front and center on the radar screen. Right mm. now, uh, there are other priorities uh, uh, for, for the United States uh, and making sure that, that somehow the, the income situation uh, for, uh, for the lower income uh, individuals and things like that are somewhat protected during this pandemic and, and also to get that vaccine into as many people's arms as possible. That's going to be the major focus uh, rather than trade with China. Yeah, uh, Andy, probably the Chinese decision makers will uh, give Biden some time to think over. But what do you think uh, the authorities here in China should do or messages should be sending to the U.S. about China's uh, thinking on, on U.S.-China relations, economic relations? Well, I think one of the hallmarks of Chinese policy in general, but certainly uh, towards its relationship with the U.S., has been very measured, calibrated, and rational. So I don't expect that to change. Uh, my hope, though, is that Biden can be the Deng Xiaoping of the United States, meaning being very pragmatic and saying the U.S. faces some very, very severe challenges uh, that I personally believe are largely ideological. And if the U.S. can get past uh, some of these irrational ways of looking at the world, looking at its own domestic problems, and perhaps if Biden can be the catalyst for that, we can really be in a much better world. Uh, certainly the U.S.-China relationship would be better. I mean, let's look at the ways that China, we just talked about, handled the pandemic uh, remarkably yeah. successfully. There are lessons there. Look at infrastructure. The U.S. Uh, long has uh, recognized, or it's been recognized around the world, that it has uh, decaying infrastructure that needs investment and expertise. And what's holding back some of this really is ideology and unwillingness okay. to learn from people that think differently. A Anthony, uh, very briefly, uh, Biden is planning to roll out a 1.9 trillion stimulus. Uh, what, is, uh, what is the interest for China? Are Chinese investors looking at that too? I think they should, because what that's going to do is put a lot of money into people's pocketbooks, and that is going to continue to support uh, uh, Chinese uh, exports. And I know that I agree with Andy that dual circulation is an important strategy for China, where they actually attend to their domestic economy and also their uh, the export economy. Uh, but for now, uh, China continues to make progress. Hopefully, in the second half of the year, consumer spending will pick up. The service sector in China will pick up. But with regard to all the stimulus, it's certainly going to continue to be uh, a good support uh, mechanism for Chinese okay. exports uh, during uh, 2021 with uh, all the stimulus. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony, and thank you, Andy. You'll be watching Dialogue here on CGTN. I'm Zhou Beijing. Thanks so much for watching. Goodbye.